Hi everyone and welcome to our final module, Conducting a Physical Search. So in this module we're going to talk about the physical techniques and I'm also going to give you some referrals for some other great resources that are already out there so I don't repeat what they have already said. And we're also going to talk about some of the common sense and a little more esoteric things that we need to do when we are physically searching for a missing pet. So first we're going to talk a little bit about equipment. Now there is a lot of equipment out there that you could potentially use when looking for a missing pet. We're just going to talk about a few key items today because what I'm recommending for all of you taking this class is that you don't just go out and try to do this yourself. That you will work with others who are already looking for missing pets, those who are professionals, and I have folks I can refer you to if you would like to follow up on that, or volunteers in your area, folks who work or volunteer at your local shelters. Network with others and find mentors to help you do this kind of work, people who know the areas, who know the people, and who know the animals. So one of the most important pieces of equipment is a microchip scanner. And the costs have actually gone down, which is awesome. They were going up there for a while. The one I bought was 300 and some dollars. Now you can get them for as low as 250 through Found Animals, which is a nonprofit, so they can have their prices much lower than the other companies, which are regular for-profit companies. So it's about 250 and up. Some of them have the ability to store the numbers. There's one that's on a pole that can be used for a more fractious animal. I prefer just your basic handheld scanner and the proper training to handle and get close enough to an animal to do the scanning. Because if you don't know how to handle an animal that is afraid and might scratch or bite you, a different piece of equipment isn't really going to help. What you need is someone experienced in safely and humanely handling animals, and you need training to be able to do that. So we recommend that you choose one from a reputable company. This is home again in the picture. I've also mentioned found animals. <clears throat> there are a couple of others. Don't go for some cheap one that you saw for sale online from some no-name company or ones that are maybe from China or something like that. This is an item that will last for years if you take care of it. Keep it clean, try not to drop it, keep the batteries fresh, don't let it get damp, just like any other piece of electronic equipment. So you'll get your investment back pretty quickly. So invest in a good one or more than one and take care of it. One of the initiatives that we are starting this year at Mission Reunite is providing scanners for organizations that don't have them. And we were surprised to find out that some agencies still don't have them in their ACO trucks, or perhaps they have a police officer, community service officer, or someone else who's not specifically an ACO doing animal control, and they don't have scanners. So that's one of the first things that we're hitting on, is for them to have that scanner in the vehicle in the field. We also believe that rescue groups who are helping to reunite missing pets should have a scanner. Anyone who's going to be finding animals and picking them up needs to be able to track for a chip. And it's great if your local vets will help you do that, but it's also inconvenient. You may not want to necessarily travel to the pet hospital to do that scan. They may not be open at that time, so just having your own scanner is a really valuable tool. So as I said, keep the batteries fresh if it's something you're using a lot. You will do that. The newer models, we just purchased some as part of this new program. I haven't actually seen them because they went to a shelter in another state. But I understand that these newer models can also be recharged with the USB charger. So I think that's awesome, and we'll be learning more about that soon. So your cat trap is a very basic piece of equipment that anyone who works with TNR, rescue, or missing pets 
needs to have. Now, you will see, especially private individuals, will go down to their feed store and buy one of those ones for like 20 bucks with the picture of the raccoon on it. And those sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Often they'll come with a squirrel trap as well in the package for 20 or $25. So for just a little bit more, you can get a really good quality piece of equipment. So there are some of the companies that are well known like Tomahawk and True Catch. Different people have different preferences because they're built a little differently, but those are some of the ones that we would recommend. If you go through a company like ACES, the link is in your assignment. A company that sells this type of equipment and they'll put their guarantee behind it and they can tell you how they are used. So this is what we would recommend. Now, you really need to be trained on how to use a trap if you haven't used it before. As you can see in the picture, there's a training being conducted for the volunteers of this organization, Outcast Cat Help. And they do TNR as well as helping people with missing pets. So one of the number one things, I'm just going to hit on a couple of things because I do believe you should have physical training where you are. But a couple important things is you don't leave these traps unattended. Sometimes people think you just set it and forget it, and that's not how that works. It's not a crock pot. You have to set it properly and in a place that is safe, and you have to be there. So ideally you're there. If it's at the home, maybe the owner is keeping an eye on it. If you're watching it, you can hang out in your car. People have different sort of alarm systems rigged up so that they can tell when the door has closed or when there's some movement near the trap. The way that you set it, people have different preferences, whether or not you line the inside, what you use to line it, do you or do you not cover it, as you can see in the picture. Some cats prefer a trap that's covered, some prefer one that's open. So you're going to learn all these things as you actually work in the field trapping cats. Once you get them in the trap, then what are you going to do? You need to cover it with a bed sheet or something like that to keep the animal calm, especially if this is a cat that's unsocialized or that was an indoor cat that's outside and is now terrified. Where are you going to put the trap? They will often urinate because they're frightened. Are you going to put it in the back of your car? I can attest to the way that your car smells when you have cat traps in it a lot. So you'll definitely want to plan for these things ahead of time and talk to other folks who do it on what they recommend as far as the use of these traps for your safety and the safety and humane handling of the cat. So the drop trap is something that is definitely for more experienced cat trappers. And there are some trap savvy cats out there. They they're often tend to be a calico. There's like one female calico that you can't catch. You got everybody else. They went right into the trap. You keep getting that dumb male who's gone in the trap six times and he's already been neutered. But you can't get that one that you really want to catch. So. This is a trap that you have to use by hand. It's similar to that basic old-fashioned mouse trap, which is the box and the stick with a string. So it's a, it's a fancier variation on that concept, and it's something that has to be set up. The animals have to become habituated to it, and once they do, you have to know the right moment to catch them. And the trap has to be secured so they don't just run off wearing the trap or knock it over or injure themselves. So there's a lot to this type of trap. It's a great tool for one that you cannot catch otherwise, but it is something that requires a little higher level training. The trail camera, and I'm going to put a link in your assignments as well. There are many different kinds and many different price points. And I can't tell you what will work best for you, but I will put some that some of our folks have used and have found to be better quality. Now there's very cheap ones you can get for maybe $50 or $70 that just have a memory card and you just set them up and then you pull the memory card out later and stick it in your computer and look at the pictures. There are higher level ones that 
are actually have wireless capability and will text you the pictures every time there's a, some kind of a motion in front of the camera. So there's a lot of different levels. Some will do video, and then obviously there's different levels of the quality of the picture. So we're not doing this to make movies. It doesn't have to be the highest quality, but it should be good enough that you can actually see the picture. So you will want to install these securely. Now people use them for hunting, so it's camouflaged. But we kind of want to camouflage them from people seeing them because people will steal them or they'll break them or just take them down because they don't understand what they are, which is why communicating with people in the area where you are doing your efforts is super important so they understand the things you're doing and maybe even a sign saying that, you know, there's you are looking for a missing cat in this area and someone can call this number if they have a question or a concern. So you're either hiding the camera really well or if it's right out in the open, I would suggest the sign. Just so if people have a concern, they can call you. If it's a big problem, you can remove it so someone else doesn't remove or break it for you. And of course, you want to be sure that you're not invading privacy because these things are going to record any movement that they have in front of them. And I've sure heard some funny stories from trappers about things they've seen, like people with their pants down and things like that, where they obviously didn't realize they were being recorded. So make sure you're not pointing to someone's house or some place where people have an expectation of privacy. Or obviously, if it is on private property, that you have the permission of the owners of that property to do so. The cat carrier. Okay, this may seem obvious, but it's easy to forget. You get out there with your traps, with your cameras, with everything else, but how do you transport the cat? Now, now, let's say it's a friendly cat that you just pick up. You're not trapping them, or maybe the cat is sick or injured or trapped somewhere under a house, so you're simply lifting the cat up in your arms. We all know that cats don't travel well and you're not going to get in the car and drive home like that. So you need to have at least one cat carrier with you. You want to use the good quality ones, plastic with a metal door like the one here in the picture. Definitely not the cardboard ones that they give you at the animal shelter to take your pet home for the day. Those are good for one time only, and certainly not for a frightened, fractious, or injured cat who might scratch or bite that you've just found that's been missing. This one in the picture, you can't see it, but it's a top loader. I like those because they're a lot easier to load the animal, especially if the cat is really scared and maybe you've wrapped them in a towel just so you don't get bitten or scratched and the cat doesn't freak out and hurt him or herself. My only caution with the top loaders is to make sure that they're securely fastened. And just because I'm worried about this, with the top loaders, I tend to just hold them on the bottom like I'm carrying a box full of books rather than by the handle on the little door on top because I always think it might pop open. So in any case, there's different models and different brands, but just good quality, plastic and metal, not the cardboard ones. And be sure you have it with you and at, at hand. If you're hopefully working as a team and you're getting the cat, your assistant can go get the carrier or if you're working by yourself, that you have it close by so you can put the cat safely in there as soon as you capture them. Because there's nothing like coming upon a missing cat and securing them, and then they get away from you again. So there are many, many, many kinds of leashes. Just go to any pet store and you will see this. For the initial capture, we like the slip leads. And you can see two different kinds here. The one on the right is commonly called an English lead or a British lead. And those are nicer quality ones that you might use at home with your own dogs. They're very thick material, very soft, easy on the hands. You can slip them and then you'll see the little leather bit that you can push down to adjust so that the circle doesn't just hang open and fall off the dog's neck. You can use that. The less expensive ones are to the left. They're some sort of a braided plastic, and they're the kind that they use at animal shelters and pet hospitals. 
So those we like because they're easy and they're also stiff. If you're approaching a dog that's maybe a little fearful or about to run away, you can kind of make a big loop like a lasso and it'll just stay open like, like a, <clears throat> a rope that you would use for roping. And you can kind of just slip that over the dog's head, tighten it up without having to really put your hands in front of their face, which is ideal. We don't recommend that you use the super cheap nylon strap ones. There's better nylon strap ones. A lot of veterinarians have them with the name printed on them. Those are okay for dogs that are really friendly. But again, they don't have the stiffness, and I really like that. I like being able to make a big circle and just hold it by the edge and slip it over the dog's head with my hand six or eight inches away from the head, that I'm not trying to hold this floppy leash open and put it over his face from the front, because dogs generally don't like that. So again, there are many different kinds, but these are just a couple that you can have with you. And they're not too expensive, so you can even have a few in your vehicle. Should you happen to run into a dog, you'll be able to capture them. So for collars, once you have the dog, now it depends on how far you're going. Do you have to put them in the car and drive somewhere? Is the owner standing right there with you? Are you taking them to the shelter? Where they're going after that is going to depend on what type of equipment you're going to use. But if you have to hang on to this dog for more than a minute, you're probably better off switching to something other than the slip lead. So the slip lead is great for the capture because you just need to get the thing on, get the dog secure. These martingale collars are awesome for preventing escape because as you can see, they're continuous. They do sell some that have a, a snap closure on them, but that kind of defeats the purpose because it's breakable. So the idea for these is that the dog doesn't wear them all the time. They're just for walking. So it can be continuous. So you adjust it to about the right size, slip it over the dog's head. You can tighten it a little bit more if necessary, depending on how big of a head they have. And then you just clip the leash to the little ring there on the outside. And it will tighten, but not indefinitely, like the old choke chain style collars. But it will tighten, and if they try to suck out of it or back out of it, that won't happen. We definitely don't recommend using regular buckle collars or snap collars for securing a dog that you have captured because they'll just pop right off. And not only do you now not have the dog, the dog also now doesn't have his identification. And that happens, unfortunately, a lot when a person's dog gets away from them, they or someone else tries to grab the collar and off it comes. So we recommend you switch to something like this along with a good leather leash or nylon leash, you know, a good quality one that's comfortable on the hand. And again, it's going to vary on the personality of the dog. If it's a big, goofy, friendly dog, they're probably going to stay right with you. But if it's a dog that's very fearful or suddenly starts doing the alligator roll or trying to get away from you, you're going to want to have a good grip on something that's not going to hurt your hand. So there are, just like the cat traps, there are dog traps. And these, again, are for the more experienced trappers. So I would recommend if you're at that point where you think a humane trap is necessary, that you will work with your local animal control or if you have dog trappers in your area who are reputable and experienced, that you would work with someone to help you to know how to set these up and how to use them. And then once the dog is in the trap, then what are you going to do? If he's standing there snarling at you, how are you going to get him out? So this is where animal control comes in. Often animal control departments will have a couple of these in their arsenal. They don't use them all the time, and especially departments that are understaffed or don't have a lot of time to be setting traps. They only come out if the dogs are confined. They're not going to have this, but it's worth a call because they're going to have the equipment. And also let them know because they have things like catch poles and they can secure a dog that may become aggressive in a situation like this, whereas you don't want to be sticking your hand in there with your little slip lead if this dog is terrified. And you also don't want the dog to bite because then they'll be on bite quarantine, and then there's that whole problem. So again, work with animal control, experienced trappers, and others to help you with this type of a situation. But it is a good tool 
for like we've talked about the dogs that are from other countries, the dogs that are completely unsocialized, that are of breeds that are quite skittish and not oriented to people and that are just not going to come when you call them. You're not going to be able to cure them just with a leash. So let's talk about some do's and don'ts. So just like your mother probably taught you, there's things you should do and things that you shouldn't do. Do, number one, have a plan when you're doing a physical search. Don't just show up. Have a plan. Coordinate your team and communicate with everyone else involved. Because if you don't, you're not going to have a coordinated effort. And this is something that we see happening in disasters. We see people simply showing up. There have been fire situations where people were evacuated. And multiple people showed up with horse trailers to pick up the horses. And while their intentions were good, these people ended up blocking the access road to emergency responders who were trying to come in and remove and treat people. And so in that particular county after that happened, they developed a system for people to be registered and on call and so it could be coordinated who was going to be on the only access road for that mountain community so that the fire trucks could get in and out, ambulances and others, and horse trailers could come in at the right time when it was safe for them to get the horses out. So. You want to have a plan. What's your plan? You're not just going to show up and start looking around and shaking a bag of food. Okay, work with your team. What, agree, what's everyone's role in this plan? What's everyone going to do? Are we all going to be looking? Are we going to split up? Is one person going to stay at the car? Is somebody going to take notes? Are you going to use a GPS to track where you've looked? There's so many things that you can be doing to make your search more efficient. And you want some agreement between all the parties because people may have different ideas about how they're going to conduct the search. And you may disagree, but you have to agree on your plan or else you'll be working against each other. Don't be an uninvited volunteer. We see a lot of this in the world of missing pets. I see a lot of it online, especially where you have keyboard jockeys who are sitting there Share, 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 which I'm not saying that's bad. It's really helpful in some ways. It helps get animals adopted, and it also helps with missing pets in many cases. However, I also see some people jumping in, commenting on every missing pet post, trying to call the people, trying to get involved, whether the owners want them to or not. And often owners are saying, you know, I've got people here helping me, I'm just posting this so you can share if you have a sighting. If you're in my area and you have a sighting or a lead, please let me know. I don't want you know, 50 other people just showing up and helping me search or giving me all this unsolicited advice. We've also had people, not our people, but other people, actually go out and, and start searching when the owners don't even know that they're there searching. And make comments about the signs that they've made and basically interfere with something where they weren't invited to help. So be sure that your help is wanted before you start helping. And if people are being difficult, like they sometimes can be, and they don't want your help, then just back away. There's plenty of other people who will need your help. Another problem, which we talked about earlier in this course, is that Random groups of people trying to help can also scare the animal. If you have multiple different people chasing a dog, for example, that dog is going to become more and more skittish and could possibly run out into traffic, as well as all your different efforts could be at cross purposes. You could have people putting some food out over here and trying to attract the dog. You could have some people putting food out over there and maybe now you're attracting wildlife, which is frightening the pet animals away because you have coyotes or raccoons or something coming and eating this food. So there has to be a coordinated plan or else it's just not going to work. Do be prepared, just like the Boy Scouts say. Okay, plan your day, 
bring everything with you, make sure everything's in good working order. If you haven't been out searching lately, are the batteries working in your scanner? Was your leather leash chewed up by the last dog you had it on? Okay, make sure that everything, check everything before you leave the house. And if you have a box of microchips, you can always check the scanner against the chip in the package. Or if not, just scan one of your own pets that's chipped and just make sure that it's in good working order. Your leashes, your traps, everything. What you don't want is to get out there and have stuff that isn't functioning. Because being unprepared wastes time, first of all. And if your equipment fails, you can scare the animal. And I've seen it with, actually, there's some difficulty sometimes with those really big dog traps with the doors closing and then bouncing back open again. And that's just a design flaw that folks are, at the company are working on. But let's say something like that happens. You have a trap and it's sticky or something, so it either doesn't close or it only closes halfway and the animal gets back out again. Do you think they're ever going to go in that trap again? Probably not. So make sure everything is in good working order before you head out. Safety. I keep talking about safety because as animal people, we often don't think that way. We're like, oh my God, I have to help this animal. And we don't think about our own safety. First of all, know the area where you're searching. If, is it where you live? Are you familiar with it? Do you know the neighbors? Do they recognize you? Are you in some completely different area? Are people used to seeing someone walking around in the woods or wherever it is that you're going to be looking? I made the mistake just the other day of looking for a missing cat. I was walking behind the owner's house, but I had to walk by some other houses and a couple women came out of the house and said, excuse me, can we help you? I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm working for your neighbor. The cat got out. I'm trying to find the cat. They said, okay. But luckily, they were nice people. But boy, they came right out of the house when they saw someone wandering around back by their backyard. So know the area where it compares, if possible, because if something happens to you, how is anybody going to know? And how long will you be out there or missing before someone notices that you didn't come home on time? Let people know that you're working in the area. I think I already told the story of Squeakers, whose owner's neighbors called the police. Now, she knows most of her neighbors. They were all helping her. But there was one that might have been a newer neighbor who saw her wandering around out there at night with a flashlight looking for the cat. And they called the police. And the police were understanding, of course, when she explained the situation, and she's a homeowner there, so it was not a big deal. But if you're in some area where you don't live and the people are questioning you and they don't know why you're there and they don't want you to be there, you could run into some trouble. So you want to make sure to have a good plan. So don't be careless about this. Just th think about these things ahead of time. You could be harassed, like the two women who came out and said, what are you doing back here? You could be harmed if it's the kind of area, I mean, around here and I'm sure in many parts of the country and world, people who live in the mountains, who live more in the backcountry, like to be left alone. And if they see someone wandering around, they're not going to appreciate that. So you don't know if people are armed. You don't know if they are sane. Or you don't know if they're on drugs. You don't know what the situation is when you're dealing with people, especially near their homes or in isolated areas. So you don't want to be harmed or injured. You don't want to be arrested. You could also be accidentally injured. Just looking for that cat the other day, I was walking up from a creek and tripping on rocks and, and there are spiders and there could have been snakes back there. So you're not thinking about that. You're just thinking, I got to get the cat. But you could twist your ankle. You could fall. You could be hit by a car. We're not thinking about these things when we're so focused on finding the animal. But again, if you're alone, make sure your cell phone is on you. And I mean, tucked in your pocket or on a belt clip or something very tight. Don't leave it in the car because you're going to go back in five or ten minutes 
Because what if something happens? What if you fall? What if you twist your ankle? What if you can't get back to the car? So think about that. Or better yet, have someone else with you so you can help each other. So let's talk about cats. <clears throat> so we talked already about best ways to look for a cat and the myths and scams to avoid. But today we'll talk about some specific search techniques. And I'm also referring you to a great book and DVD, so I'm not reinventing the wheel. The link for that is in your assignments. I would highly recommend checking that out. It's an ebook by The Lost Cat Finder that goes into great detail on this subject. But just in general, for cats, you're going to start in the home. You're going to look everywhere. In fact, someone that we know just recently, she moved and her cat went missing, and she somehow thought the cat got out. But fortunately, by the end of the day, she realized that the cat was in a laundry cupboard. So this happens all the time. Cats either get stuck or they're just hanging out in there and they don't meow or make any noise. And you'll find them in there at the end of the day or a couple of days later. So you want to look everywhere, even in places that are ridiculous. Cats get into the walls. They get into the ceiling. They get into furniture. You would be amazed. Look everywhere in the house and then look again. They can get into outbuildings, garages, sheds. They love things like that. Leave the doors open. They'll go in there and then get stuck under the house. This is especially dangerous because there have been cases where cats went in and then the homeowner sealed the hole and now they can't get back out. So you know, those little vents under your house, if the cats get in there and also raccoons and whatever else is going under your house, then maybe they can't get out or above your house. Depends on the layout of the house. So you want to do a really super thorough search starting from close to home. And then anytime something like this happens, if a cat disappears, what changed recently? You always want to ask yourself that. Did a new person move in or out? Was there a big change, something that would cause a stress to the cat? Did they get a dog or another cat? We had a case not too long ago where the cat kept going to someone else's house and that person meant well and was feeding the cat and even took her to the vet because she had a flea allergy. And the vet scanned the cat and said, yeah, she's got a chip. She has an owner who wasn't too far away. And that person was concerned, like, why is this cat coming here and not going home? Well, it turns out the owner recently got a dog. And so I don't think the dog was trying to harm the cat, but the cat was afraid. So she was spending all her time outside and not wanting to come back in the house because of the dog. And we all know that new cats don't always get along. There can be conflicts. So the other cat can either be hiding somewhere in the house or maybe goes away like the cat that I just talked about goes and hangs out at somebody else's house. Have you recently done work on the house or yard? Construction is a big one. It's obviously very stressful. It's very noisy. People are coming and going from the house, perhaps leaving doors or windows open. You have to be super diligent during times like that. And realize if your cats are in the house, they might hide or they might try to get out. Or if they're outside, they may go across the street or a block away and just stay away until all the noise and activity starts because most cats are not really welcoming to strangers and noise. When you're searching outdoors, you're going to start from the house or the place last seen because maybe they got away somewhere else, like at the vet's office or at a boarding kennel or they were in the car. So you're going to start your search from the place they were last seen. And typically, they don't go very far. You're going to look for hiding places. That's nine times out of ten, that's where you're going to find a cat. They're not going to be strolling down the street like a dog. They're going to be hiding somewhere. They're going to be in the bushes. You're going to be under a tree, under a structure, under a car. Something like that is where you're going to find them. Unfortunately, you're also going to keep your eye out for remains. We had a case recently where, unfortunately, the outdoor access cat did not come home one night. And he's like clockwork. 
two cats, brothers, come home every night at 5 or 6 o'clock for their dinner. Didn't come home. The owners did everything right, looked everywhere, and unfortunately, the next day, the neighbor informed them that the cat came into their field and was killed by a dog. So it's an unfortunate outcome, but we appreciate that at least the neighbor was honest because it was probably his dog that did it. He could have just not mentioned anything and avoided trouble, but he was kind enough to tell the neighbor what had happened so they would know and not keep looking and looking forever and not knowing what happened. So unfortunately, you are, you are also looking for remains, especially when you're looking outside. So the trail cams are super valuable in establishing the presence of a cat. Back in the old days, we believed that cats had magical powers, that they could disappear, that they could walk through walls and appear in the house and outside of the house. And I totally get why people believe these things, because it seems like they can't. There have been cats that people haven't seen for weeks, and they're sure that they're not there. You put the camera in the backyard, and there they are. But they're never there when the people are looking. So they do seem to simply disappear and reappear at will. So the nice thing about the camera is it tells you where the cat is and it gives the owner hope. So if they wanted to give up, you can say, look, the cat is in your backyard or next door or wherever. And now we can put some food out. We can set a trap. We can take whatever steps we want to take to get the cat securely back in the home. So the humane trap is usually what you're going to use to secure the cat or if they're very friendly, you can just pick them up. But it's going to depend on the situation. And many cats are so frightened that the trap is a good tool to at least get them secure, get them back in the house, and then you can let them back out of the trap. But if they're old, sick, injured, just sitting there, and you can just pick them up and put them in a carrier, you can do that as well. But one word of caution, when cats are injured, especially if they're severely injured, like if they've been hit by a car, they can just randomly bite and not necessarily have control of their bodily functions. So you will really want to be careful if they look like they're badly injured. Maybe use a towel or a blanket to carefully lift them and put them into the carrier. Dogs. So it's the same for cats. You want to start at the place last seen and work logically from there. Now I say that there's a lot of different possibilities. It's not just one. And they're different from cats. They don't usually run to the first place where they can hide and hang out there. So there's a lot of factors when looking for a missing dog because you want to think, okay, where did the dog go and why? What were they looking for? Were they just exploring? Did they get out and just have fun walking around the neighborhood? Were they tired or hungry? Was it hot? Were they looking for shelter or water? Are they an intact adult? Are they looking to mate with another dog? Are they looking for another male or a female dog? What is the reason why are they going somewhere? Or are they just wandering around? Did they just get out and they're just wandering? So there's a lot of possibilities. So what you want to do once you started looking from your point of origin is to work off of leads. And these are going to be super helpful to you. So this is where your signs, your e-blasts, your radio ads, whatever it is that you're doing to get the word out, you're going to start getting some leads. People are going to call, I saw a black dog on such and such a street. Okay, so hopefully you're getting a lot of calls and you can narrow it down to, well, this one's five miles away and sounds different, but I got three calls for this area that all sound really good. So I'm going to start looking there first. And that's kind of where you can start focusing your search. So this is why it's important to communicate with everyone in your area and to talk to the police, whoever does animal control, also mail carriers, UPS, anybody who's out there walking around the neighborhood. If you see parents who walk with their kids to school every day, Anybody who's out and about and seeing things, retired people, people who work at home, anyone who has their eyes on the community. You want, somebody saw something and you want them to report it to you. Dogs can travel long distances, but again, it, it depends. 
So they breed, of course, like the dachshunds in the picture. Now, dachshunds probably won't get very far, but they also have really selective hearing, and they get really obsessed with certain things. So dachshunds might take off chasing a rat or something and not come back and then get lost in the woods somewhere. A young husky could possibly run for miles because that's just what those kind of dogs do. So again, it depends on their breed, on their age. Obviously, a younger dog, a healthier dog, can travel a longer distance and in a shorter time. Depends on the terrain. Is it like we talked about earlier? Is it super hot? Are you out in a desert? Are you in the mountains? Are you in the middle of a metro area? So where the dog's going to run into lots of different people, there's going to be a lot of variables that you need to look at in your search. So it's going to be important to plan, as we already said, to plan and to track your search. Keep track of where you have looked and the things you have tried so you're not repeating your efforts. Okay, I found the animal. Now what? And I, I added this bit at the end because some of our folks that we have worked with have run into challenges when they've found the animal and then and then what? Then <laughs> what do you do? If the owner's not standing there for you to hand the animal to, you now have some decisions to make. So you want to have a plan. What's your plan? Is the owner standing next to you ready to take the animal home or to the vet? Perfect. You hand them off, it's not your problem anymore. Are you looking for a specific missing pet? In other words, are you helping someone? Are you looking for Fluffy who's missing in this area? You're helping them look. Or are you helping to pick up unidentified strays? Are you helping to catch a dog that's been running with your area? Are you helping to catch cats, for example, in our areas that were devastated by fires where we have neighborhoods that don't exist anymore? And people are trying to get their cats back. So cats are being trapped in that area and compared to the listings of those cats that are missing when the owners have had to leave the area. Do you have the owner's contact info with you or someone's contact info to say, okay, I've got the animal. What do you want me to do with it? And what if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, etc.? So you want to kind of have a plan for this, for when you catch the animal, what happens next? And then where will the animal go right now? So again, are you going to hand them off to the owner? Are they going to come to your house? Is this? Do you have a place to segregate an animal that is going to be terrified and might be sick or injured and you certainly don't want them escaping from your house and now being lost in a different area? Now you'd have even a bigger problem. Are you going to take them to the shelter? So that is an option for many people. If the owner can't pick up the animal and you can't take them home, what are you going to do? You're not an animal shelter. You're just a person with your home. So are you going to take them to the animal shelter? And you want to be very sure that you know their policies. There are still shelters that euthanize cats that aren't friendly. There are still shelters that don't do TNR, return to field programs. So if you drop off a cat that's not friendly, the outcome is probably not going to be good. And how proactive is the shelter in looking for owners? All the stuff we talked about. Do they post the animals online? Do they have public friendly business hours? Does somebody pick up the phone? Et cetera, et cetera. So in some cases, the shelter might be your only option. Let's say you've just captured a dog that's not friendly with cats and you have a house full of cats. Well, obviously you're not going to bring that dog home. So if no one else can safely contain them, they're going to have to go to the shelter. But you just want to know what the policies are and will you have any right to follow up? And with shelters that are getting more progressive, they will allow people to be involved and you can call and find out what's going on. You can put your name down as a call if the animal needs rescue and et cetera. Others don't do that. They don't figure that you have any rights because you're not the owner. And once you turn over the animal, it's their property. And that's the end of your involvement. So just be very sure that you know these policies and you discuss it with someone ahead of time before dropping off the animal. 
and some other things that happen. What if the owner doesn't want the animal back? And that happens, and judging them won't help because <laughs> it's too late. There have been situations like that, especially where the animal was very troublesome, very skittish, and maybe they didn't have the animal very long, maybe they just adopted it, and it gets out, and this cadre of people work really hard and capture the animal, and the person's like, I don't want it back. So <laughs> you need a plan B. If it's the shelter, if it's a rescue group, if there's someone in your group that has fallen in love with the animal and may want to keep it or at least foster it, so <laughs> that's always going to be a possibility. So what if the owners are out of town? What if it's one of these pet sitting cases where the animal gets out when the owner is not there? and Maybe they're in Europe or something, so they can't get back tomorrow. They may not be back for a week. So you have to have a plan for that. Can somebody hang on to the animal? Can it go back to their house? Can it go to a boarding facility? What's the situation? What if there's a dispute over ownership? You'd be amazed. This happens too. You have ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives, etc., who argue over ownership of an animal and who you're going to give it back to. So there's, so there's a lot of crazy things that can happen once you find an animal and think it's all over. And you're going to have to make some value judgments. And if things get really crazy, that's where you can just involve the authorities and involve the shelter and maybe turn it over to them to decide who they can determine is the legal owner or to the police or whoever do, does animal control in your area. So basically, you want to do your part, but then you can bow out of these other situations that really shouldn't be your concern. So for success, use common sense. I know I say that a lot, but it's true. Stop, think, safety, use common sense. Don't get involved if people don't want you to get involved. Have a plan, safety first, and you will be much more likely to be successful. And I should have also added here to pick your battles. There's a lot of animals out there needing help. There's a lot of people needing help. So get yourself involved in the ones where you can help, where there aren't already 50 people helping, or where someone has specifically asked you for help for some reason, or if you're in the shelter and you're assisting people as they come in and asking you for help. So again, use common sense. Use your time wisely and you will have a greater chance of being successful with more owner reunions.